The flow-directed, balloon-tipped pulmonary artery catheter, also known as the Swan-Gans catheter, permits measurement of intracardiac filling pressures. The catheter is inserted directly into the right atrium, right ventricle, and the pulmonary artery. The catheter permits measurement of the wedge pressure in the pulmonary artery, which approximates the left atrial pressure. The catheter also permits determination of cardiac output using various techniques. Pulmonary artery catheterization can be used to diagnose and manage pulmonary hypertension, cardiogenic shock, mixed shock states, cardiac tamponade, and mechanical complications of ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, known as STEMI, including right ventricular infarction, ventricular septal rupture, and papillary muscle rupture. Pulmonary artery catheterization is also part of the standard evaluation of patients being considered for heart or lung transplantation. Pulmonary artery catheterization should not be part of the routine treatment of patients who are undergoing high-risk surgery or who have septic shock, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or acute decompensated heart failure. In these populations, randomized trials have shown no benefits and possible harms. Instead, cardiac function and volume status should be assessed using non-invasive means, such as physical examination, measurement of serum B-type natriuretic peptide concentration, echocardiography, sonographic assessment of inferior vena cava diameter during respiration, and measurement of pulse pressure variation during respiration. Absolute contraindications include right-sided endocarditis or right-sided intracardiac masses or thrombi. Relative contraindications include severe coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia, which may complicate sheath placement and should be corrected before the procedure is performed. Exercise caution and consider using fluoroscopy in patients with tricuspid regurgitation, which makes catheter passage more difficult, and in patients with left bundle branch block, in whom catheter passage may induce complete heart block. To create a sterile field, you will need chlorhexidine and a sterile fenestrated drape and towels. You will also need a surgical cap, sterile gloves, a surgical mask with eye shield, and a sterile gown. To place the introducer sheath, you will need gauze, sterile saline flushes, a 25-gauge needle with syringe, 1% lidocaine, an 18-gauge introducer needle with syringe, a guide wire, a scalpel with a number 11 blade, the introducer sheath itself with an internal obturator, sutures, a needle driver, scissors, and an antibiotic impregnated adhesive dressing. If the sheath is being placed with the use of ultrasound guidance, which is recommended, then you will also need an ultrasound device and probe, a sterile sleeve for the probe, and sterile conduction jelly. To place the pulmonary artery catheter, you will need the catheter, a plastic sleeve, sterile saline flushes, appropriate tubing, and an electronic pressure monitor, preferably one capable of displaying multiple tracings at the same time. Because arrhythmias may occur during placement of a pulmonary artery catheter, you should have resuscitation equipment on hand during the procedure. If you are placing a catheter in a patient with a left bundle branch block, you should be prepared to place a transvenous pacemaker in case complete heart block occurs. Finally, if you are going to use fluoroscopy, you will need lead aprons and thyroid guards for everyone in the room but the patient who may be selectively shielded in a manner that does not cover the chest or interfere with sheath insertion. Before the procedure, review the design of the standard pulmonary artery catheter. The marks along the catheter indicate the distance from the tip. Thin marks indicate 10 centimeters, and thick marks indicate 50 centimeters. A proximal port, usually blue, connects to a lumen 30 centimeters from the catheter tip and is used to transduce right atrial pressures once the catheter is in its final position. A distal port, usually yellow, connects to the catheter tip and is used to transduce all pressures during catheter insertion or pulmonary artery pressures once the catheter is in its final position. Some catheters contain an additional port, usually clear or white, that connects to a second lumen 30 centimeters from the catheter tip and may be used for infusions. A pink or red port is used to inflate the balloon at the catheter tip. Use only the syringe packaged with the catheter as it fills only to the balloon's capacity. When fully inflated, the balloon should completely encircle the tip of the catheter, which reduces mechanical trauma during insertion. It is essential that the balloon be inflated whenever the catheter is advanced 
and then deflated whenever the catheter is withdrawn. The final port is connected to a thermistor near the catheter tip and can be connected to a computer for measurement of cardiac output by thermodilution. After you have obtained informed consent and have reviewed a checklist about the patient and the procedure with the treatment team, place the patient in the supine position. Select a central vein and, if possible, visualize it with ultrasonography to confirm its location and patency. The right internal jugular vein and the left subclavian vein are ideal sites because the curvature of the pulmonary artery catheter facilitates passage through the heart. Advancing the catheter from the left internal jugular vein, right subclavian vein, or femoral vein as shown here, can be more challenging and often requires fluoroscopic guidance. After thoroughly washing your hands and donning the sterile garments and sterile gloves, prepare the skin over the vein with chlorhexidine. Place the sterile towels and drape over the patient. Cover the ultrasound probe with the sterile sleeve. Flush the ports on the sheath and the pulmonary artery catheter with sterile saline. Inflate the balloon at the tip of the catheter to ensure there is no air leak. And finally, slide the plastic sleeve over the catheter toward the ports. You will approach the central vein using the modified Seldinger technique, which involves accessing the vein with a needle, passing a guide wire through the needle, and then introducing the sheath into the vein over the guide wire. To begin, use the 25 gauge needle to infiltrate the skin with lidocaine. Next, advance the 18 gauge needle toward the vein while applying negative pressure to the syringe. If you are cannulating an internal jugular or femoral vein, use ultrasound to guide the needle. Once dark red, non pulsatile blood is aspirated, remove the syringe from the needle and insert the guide wire. Use the scalpel to stab the skin adjacent to the needle and then carefully remove the needle. While stabilizing the guide wire to ensure that it remains accessible and does not embolize, insert the sheath and obturator over the guide wire until the hub of the sheath fills the incision. Remove the guide wire and obturator, leaving only the sheath. Using a sterile flush, test the port to ensure adequate blood flow. Instruct your assistant to connect the pulmonary artery catheter to the pressure monitor. While holding the catheter level with the patient's heart, Instruct your assistant to set the pressure reading to zero. Orient the catheter so that its curvature follows its expected path and insert the catheter into the sheath. Insert the catheter 15 centimeters so that its tip is outside of the sheath, then inflate the balloon. Continue to advance the catheter until a right atrial waveform is transduced. From an internal jugular or subclavian vein, the distance to the right atrium is typically 15 to 20 centimeters. The right atrial waveform has several identifiable components, an A wave, which indicates atrial contraction, an X descent, which indicates atrial relaxation and contains a small C wave, which indicates closure of the tricuspid valve, a V wave, which indicates passive atrial filling, and a Y descent, which indicates opening of the tricuspid valve and passive atrial emptying. Instruct your assistant to write down the mean right atrial pressure. Advance the catheter another 5 to 10 centimeters until a right ventricular waveform is transduced. This waveform is notable for a swift upstroke and downstroke, representing ventricular contraction and relaxation, as well as a slower upstroke, representing passive ventricular filling, followed by atrial contraction. Instruct your assistant to write down the systolic and diastolic right ventricular pressures. Next, advance the catheter another 5 to 10 centimeters until a pulmonary artery waveform is transduced. This waveform is distinguished from the right ventricular waveform by a decline rather than increase in pressure during diastole, an increase in overall diastolic pressure, and a dichrotic notch, which represents the closure of the pulmonic valve. Instruct your assistant to write down the systolic, diastolic, and mean pulmonary artery pressures. Continue to advance the catheter until the wedge pressure waveform is transduced. This waveform is similar to that of the right atrium, except that greater variation may be noted with respiration. Instruct your assistant to write down the mean pressure at the end of expiration, whether the patient is breathing spontaneously or receiving mechanical ventilation. Note that in mechanically ventilated patients, positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, may increase the measured wedge pressure. However, when the PEEP is less than 10 centimeters of water, the effect is typically negligible. Now, 
deflate the balloon. The pulmonary artery pressure waveform should reappear. If it does not, slowly withdraw the catheter until it does. Aspirate blood from the distal port to measure the mixed venous oxygen saturation. Measure cardiac output by connecting the thermistor to a computer and injecting a saline bolus into the right atrium. On a plot of temperature against time, the area under the curve is inversely proportional to the cardiac output. Fasten the plastic sleeve to the sheath and secure the catheter. Suture the sheath to the skin and apply an antibiotic impregnated adhesive dressing over the wound. Obtain a portable chest radiograph to confirm appropriate positioning of the catheter and to rule out a pneumothorax. The tip of the catheter should not extend more than 4 or 5 centimeters beyond the midline. With the catheter in place, the right atrial and pulmonary artery pressures can be monitored continuously. The balloon can be periodically reinflated to reassess the pulmonary artery wedge pressure, but it should always be deflated afterward. Technical problems can occur during catheter insertion. If a right ventricular waveform cannot be obtained, the catheter may be coiling in the right atrium or exiting through the opposite vena cava. Tricuspid regurgitation may also be present and is suggested by large V waves on the right atrial tracing, which represent retrograde atrial filling. If a pulmonary artery waveform cannot be obtained, the catheter may be coiling in the right ventricle. In each instance, the balloon should be deflated and the catheter withdrawn about 10 centimeters. The balloon can then be reinflated and the catheter readvanced. If catheter passage remains unsuccessful, the procedure should be attempted again with fluoroscopic guidance. Common early complications include ventricular arrhythmias and right bundle branch block, which are generally self limited. Complete heart block may occur in patients with pre existing left bundle branch block. If complete heart block occurs, transvenous pacing may be necessary. In rare cases, the guide wire may embolize and become inaccessible or the catheter may become knotted in one of the cardiac chambers, preventing withdrawal. A vascular surgeon or interventional radiologist must be consulted in either case. Two final complications, also the most dangerous, include air embolism and pulmonary artery perforation. Air embolism may occur if the ports of the catheter are not properly flushed with saline before the procedure, or if the saline-filled tubing becomes disrupted. Manifestations include dyspnea, chest pain, tachycardia, hypotension, and in some cases, an acute increase in right heart pressures. The patient should be placed in Trendelenburg's position, which will limit the outflow of air from the right ventricle, and high-flow supplemental oxygen should be administered, as it reduces the nitrogen content of blood and thereby promotes reabsorption of air. In severe cases, hyperbaric oxygen must be provided. Pulmonary artery perforation is very rare. Identified risk factors include older patient age, prolonged balloon inflation, pulmonary hypertension, and systemic anticoagulation. The typical manifestations are hemoptysis, hypoxemia, and shock. If immediate action is not taken, the risk of death is extremely high. Inflate the balloon to limit further bleeding. Intubate the patient with a dual lumen endotracheal tube and then place the patient in the lateral decubitus position with the affected side down. A thoracic surgeon and interventional radiologist must be consulted immediately because this is a true emergency. Late complications include thrombosis, catheter-related infection, and pulmonary infarction. To reduce the risk of pulmonary infarction, ensure the catheter tip is in a position where full balloon inflation is required to measure a wedge pressure. Also, be sure to deflate the balloon after measurements of the wedge pressure have been completed. Normal right atrial mean pressure is 1 to 5 millimeters of mercury. Normal right ventricular systolic and diastolic pressures are 15 to 30 over 1 to 7 millimeters of mercury. Normal pulmonary artery systolic and diastolic pressures are 15 to 30 over 4 to 12 millimeters of mercury, with a normal mean of 9 to 19 millimeters of mercury. Finally, normal mean pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is 4 to 12 millimeters of mercury. You can calculate several additional values using the data obtained from the catheter. The cardiac output can be calculated with the Fick equation, shown here. The variables involved in these calculations include VO2, or oxygen consumption, CA, the oxygen content of arterial blood, and CV, 
the oxygen content of venous blood. The cardiac index is equal to the cardiac output divided by the body surface area, or BSA. For details about how to perform these calculations, see the supplementary appendix that accompanies this video, available at nejm.org. Once cardiac output has been measured, systemic and pulmonary vascular resistances can be calculated with the equations shown here. The variables include SVR, or systemic vascular resistance, MAP, or mean systemic arterial pressure, RA, or right atrial mean pressure, PVR, or pulmonary vascular resistance, PA, or pulmonary artery mean pressure, and PCWP, or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Normal values for cardiac index and vascular resistance are shown here. In patients with shock of unknown cause, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, and mixed venous oxygen saturation can often help to guide the diagnosis. In cardiogenic shock, wedge pressure and vascular resistance are high, while cardiac output and mixed venous oxygen saturation are low. In the early phase of distributive shock, cardiac output and mixed venous oxygen saturation are high, and wedge pressure and vascular resistance are low. Finally, in hypovolemic shock, vascular resistance is high, and wedge pressure, cardiac output, and mixed venous oxygen saturation are low. It is possible to diagnose many more conditions by examining pressure waveforms. For a complete discussion, please consult the supplementary appendix that accompanies this video, available at nejm.org. Pulmonary artery catheterization yields hemodynamic data that may facilitate the diagnosis and treatment of patients with a wide range of cardiopulmonary conditions. When appropriate precautions are taken, the procedure is generally safe. However, all providers must be aware that because fatal complications can occur, the procedure should be performed only when the results are expected to aid clinical management.